as we're at this point in the worship service, um, we're obviously looking at uh, a lot of Christmassy things. And uh, I just discovered one aspect of Christmas I never realized. Uh, Rod had shared with me this morning that he had gone up to um, uh, the Christmas Story House up in Cleveland. Has anybody been up there before? A few of you have. Okay. Have you, have, has anybody seen the Christmas Story? Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you remember the scene on the roadside where he kicks over the hubcap full of lug nuts? You don't remember that? Now you're going to look it up on your phone. Yeah. Okay. All right. Some of you are like smiling. Yeah, I remember that scene. He said the unthinkable fudge. And uh, it was a connotation towards something completely different that was just understood. And the interesting thing about Rod's report from his foray into uh, that house up in Cleveland is he said, did you know that when you are inside that house as the story is being told, that is a completely different set? That that isn't even that house. That that house that they filmed that in is somewhere up in Canada. I said, I, I wasn't aware of that, Rod. And he said, yeah, the guy that bought the house decided that what is on the inside should be reflective of what we think is on the outside. And so he basically took the whole infrastructure of the house and he rebuilt it piece by piece so that at every turn it was correct, uh, true to the, the layout of the home in the Christmas story itself. So whenever you go up there, what you see is what you expect to get. And as we're gathered for worship today on this third Sunday of Advent, that's what I know I'm hoping is that what God has shown of himself through the Bible is what I get in the 21st century as I'm trying to live in alignment with that story that he's given us uh, so much reason to hope in. And I don't know if you're in that same place or not, but the one thing that makes it work is the fact that the story is really about, of all the things that are described in it, it is primarily about one thing, and that is the relationship that God wants to have with you and I that existed at one point in the storyline, but fell apart as the story unfolded, and now God was in the business of trying to draw us close. Maybe you're here today because God is, in your mind, far away. Uh, the story of the Bible is almost uh, a distant language that doesn't make any, any sense from the, from the vantage point of the world that you live in. And maybe as you're drawn into this place today, we can change that picture a little bit so that what is on the outside actually will depict the realities that are at work on the inside. And I believe that God is in the business of drawing every single one of us closer. And if you'll just indulge me for a minute, uh, or for the next several minutes, I, I want to explore just how that comes to, comes to bear on your life and mine. Because I wonder sometimes, God, are you angry? Are you distant? Are my sins of such a nature that they alienate you completely? Is there this fear that I need to have of you that only in your wrath the pain of your son can justify me coming before you? And as I look at that picture, I realize that's a, that's a fearful view of God. And I wonder, is that God's heart really? And with anything relationship-wise, it's always complicated, isn't it? If we look at our story today that uh, is, is, is kind of prompted by the, the picture pastorally of sheep out there in the field in the, in the evening with the, the moonlight uh, uh, just off at a distance, and yet there is something that is otherworldly, something that is a manifestation of the very glory of God comes upon a few shepherds of all the nondescript human beings on the planet, for God to decide at this critical moment, I'm going to reveal everything that I have build, been building up to for thousands of years 
In this moment, I'm going to reveal what I've done to make everything what it needs to be finally, once and for all. And I'm going to, I'm going to reveal it to these shepherds. And as we're looking at that story, if you're like me, you're kind of scratching your head and you're saying, God, why would you do that with them when what you've accomplished is so overwhelmingly, over-the-top, epically dramatic? Why would you look at this handful of society's really lowest class of people and use them as the dignitaries that would be worthy to announce the good news. Well, God's reasons and our logic sometimes go cross purposes. And maybe you're here today because your reasons for who you think God is uh, um, maybe are keeping him farther away than he needs to be. And maybe God wants to speak to your heart today as you just hear his story. God's story goes something like this. He has made us in his image and likeness, which is a, a really, a, a, a very profound thing to say about how he looks at us as his creatures. He's designed all of us to be sort of kings and queens of, uh, of all of creation. And it, it really is, is how the story begins. But because like any relationship, when there are different parties involved and there is a lack of agreement about how the relationship should work, things tend to fall apart. And initially, the relationship worked good. There's a honeymoon period, like many relationships. But eventually, the story is told in Genesis 3 that the two who are made in God's image in a profound and deep relationship with God, that God desired so much, he said it was very good, that relationship began to disintegrate. And as it did the two different groups just sort of went in their own way. And the reason I say groups is because, interestingly enough, the type of God that we're talking about isn't just one person in a sense, but mysteriously he is actually three bundled up into one, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, just sort of in that, in that divine dance in eternity, uh, in, in, in relating to one another as a single God and trying to show that just as they are in community and relationship with each other harmoniously, they want to expand on that in a way that we are brought into that relationship. And that really is what's going on behind the scene, is God is looking intently upon your life and mine and saying, I want to be in your world. But there are things keeping us, that is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, out of your world. And we want to do everything that we can in that sense of being God as we are to make sure that we can bring everything into a correct relationship. And we live in the wake of how all of that transpired. And the very, the, the, the very pinnacle of that mystery as it unfolded over time in the form of a plan that took on a characteristic in Bethlehem that no one really expected God to show up that way. But if you go back to the Genesis story once again, you find that God is sort of distant from the people that he has made and they're making choices that aren't in alignment with his choices and it just sort of unfolds in all of its chaos and dysfunctionality. And maybe even today we're in our own relationships feeling that. Because people that we love and are close to, we may not be going in the same direction. And people that we want to maybe connect with, maybe they're going in a direction that we don't feel comfortable with either. How will these relationships ever work? And on a microcosm, I think about why this is the case. And like any... Any parent, I always uh, talk to my kids about, you know, the sex talk. Uh, basically, it amounts to, in, 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 in many cases, a long ride on the bike trail uh, with uh, one kid having the conversation about that aspect of the life that God has given them. And usually by the time I get to Lisbon from Franklin Square, 
pretty much got all the nitty gritty out in the open. And as they're absorbing the substance of that, I'm sure they've heard bits and pieces about it. But the thing that I really want to drive home to them is the understanding that going on behind the scenes in the intimacy of what is very pleasurable are either forces at work that will generate chaos and dysfunctionality in the relationship or forces at work that will create harmony. And what I underscore in that conversation and have underscored with them is that typically when you get it out of place, it'll go south. Because the expectations of both people that are in, engaging in something that is so beautiful that God has made, but doing it under their own terms, one person making up their own idea about what's transpiring in that relationship and another person having their own concept of what that means and when they come together the pleasure ensues but then the consequences. Because like anything great that's created, if it's not aligned in a purposeful way in its own right, it becomes unhealthy. And this is what I try to get across to my kids is that the reason why marriage is such a good thing is because generally it's based around a covenant where there is a mutual agreement about how the relationship is supposed to work. And when you agree on that, then when you relate to each other at any level, including the sexual level, you discover that there's a peace and there's a harmony and there's a joy and there's a blessing. And of course, there's children that come out of that. And when you don't have that covenant... It ends maybe differently. Like I thought that you said that we were a thing. You obviously had a different idea about what is happening here. My feelings are all over the map. And the person over here is saying, mine are all over the map too because I don't know what you want. And pastorally, I've seen this time and time again. Any relationship where there's not an agreed upon understanding of expectations, of things that you both desire, of things that you share together, of being aligned and going in the same direction, I say when that's not there, inevitably, it's probably going to end badly. And the reason that it does goes all the way back to the reason why we've disconnected from God. We've decided we're going to make our own rules for the relationship. And God said, as good as that sounds, we're probably not going to be able to even communicate very well anymore. But thank goodness we are in this room because God decided he would not give up on, 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 on you or me. That he longs to be in a relationship with us. To have his presence be a part of our lives. And the way that he's gone about that, I think, as we look to this episode that's on the screen, it bears uh, some consideration. Now, after the garden, you had Abraham, and eventually you had Moses. And if you've ever heard the story, you know God had created a lot of people out of his own child, Abraham. And the net result was they found themselves in Egypt. And in Egypt, they were under the heavy-handed, oppressive uh, uh, captivity of Pharaoh himself. And they were just broken. And they were not functioning as the people that they were designed to function in, in, in a glorious way they were almost just blankly staring out into the world knowing that they couldn't make any choices for themselves without Pharaoh directing them. And in that very dehumanized state, they cried out to God. And God interrupted their lives by first of all interrupting the life of Moses, appearing to him as a shepherd in the middle of the wilderness in the form, as Moses was doing his shepherding, in the form of a burning bush. And the fire emanating out of that bush 
in some strange way, wasn't consuming the bush itself. But rather the fire was God's way of saying, this is who I am. In this form, I am fire. And Moses, take your shoes off because you are standing on holy ground. You're standing in the very presence of the creator of the universe. And Moses, overwhelmed by the spectacle, fell on his knees, took off his shoes, and did what needed to be done. Because this God that sort of was on the periphery of his life was now revealing himself front and center. Disrupting his world considerably, but doing so in a way that led to a very positive end. As Moses became aware of God's call upon his life, he was able through God's orchestration to initiate a series of really supernatural events that led to their release from captivity and their call into a new place with a new hope and a new vision for the God that was somewhat distant and somewhat strange, but yet appeared to be coming close. And in the course of gathering all of these people, God said, all right, we've got to get this straight. There's uh, an agreement we have to come to. And Moses was called to draw up a, really a, a, a covenant where the understanding of how we relate to one another and the expectations are clearly defined. And as that was established, God said, not only do I want to just give you this guidance, but I also want you to know that I'm, I'm here. I'm a, real, I'm a real being. We are a real being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we want to be a part of the life of you as my people. And God said, I'm going to show you just how much I want to be present by appearing during the night in the form of a pillar of fire and during the day in the form of a pillar of cloud. And so you have fire in a bush, fire at night, a cloud during the day, God's starting to come close. And as he's coming close, he's just revealing bits and pieces of his wonderful character, but awesome character and powerful character but yet very ca compassionate character. And all of these tensions between his awesomeness and his deep love are sort of held carefully together in his person. And he's showing them, I have to be related to with this understanding. And as he brings the specific characteristics of who he is to bear upon them, he says, I need you to make a tabernacle. Not just any tabernacle, but I want you to make a, a tent where... When you worship, it will have embodied within that structure my presence. And if you've ever read the book of Exodus, you know that there are very careful um, architectural designs that, and engineering designs that go into the fabrication of this tabernacle so that God could be worshipped there. And he said, when you make it, and the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire which stands above it moves, then you got to pack up that tabernacle and move along with me because we're going somewhere. And they were just thrilled that God had chosen to come close, that God had decided that he would choose them as his people. And, and it's like any of us. When God is with us wherever we go, it makes all the difference in the world. And he was showing them, I'm on the move, and as I'm on the move, you're on the move with me. Now, God had basically set it up so that he could begin to real, reveal more specifically who his character was. And one of the things is, is that it gets a little complicated with God. I mean, just the fact that you have a tabernacle or a tent. Anybody have a pop-up tent in here? Ever go pop-up tent camping? Maybe you'll get where I'm going with this. All right, we used to have a pop-up camper, which we, my wife said it would be a great idea for the kids, and I thought it would be great too, Till I discovered upon going to the campground, unpacking everything that we just spent all evening packing uh, under basically this sort of relational structure. Uh, there's a supervisor, and I'll just say she is a female. And then there is a person in, responsible for the execution of everything that the supervisor says needs to be done, and that would be me. And as the day unfolds into afternoon, eventually everything is unpacked out of that camper so that the camp space can be 
perfectly what it needs to be with the addition of things that the supervisor is saying, you know, next time we go camping, we also need to bring blah, blah, blah. Or don't you think an awning on this would be great? And you can just see how the relationship is taking on a complexity that is actually beginning to become unbearable. If you ever, and and you'll, you'll, you'll know where the outcome of this story is. If you ever drive by, by my house, you will never see the word Jayco or anything like that uh, in my driveway. Condo. See, relationships mature and the expectations still are the same. It's not easy following God because life is complicated and there are many facets to your life on earth as well as mine. And God wants to show how at every turn, at every facet, he wants to be a part of that experience with us. I think that's why it makes it so hard sometimes to relate to God because when the story unfolds, uh, you'll see David becomes king. And David is responsible for governing a people who now have finally been settled into the land that was promised to them. And David is looking at all of the infrastructure that's been put in place, how the border is secure, how people have built their own dwellings, and the place is functioning awesomely, except for one thing. There's no place for God. Where's, where's God going to be? Because we had a tabernacle in the wilderness where he would come and dwell, but now we need a stone temple that will be the physical and permanent manifestation of his presence through that building that is designed to be the center of the worship of our community. And so at the center of the, of, of the community was a six-acre tract. And that six-acre tract was in David's vision, a place where God could begin to show himself permanently in this worship complex that he envisioned. He died before he could get off the ground, but his son Solomon took it on, built it, and it was just awesome. And people came and worshiped and offered sacrifices, and they said, God is here, we're here, it is good, life is good. But the thing is, Over time, when you just reduce God to being in one place, in a temple, in a church building, or maybe with the clergy, and everything else is the land where God isn't, then pretty soon we start to behave like we live in the land where God isn't. Except on Sunday, of course, we'll go to the place where God is and honor him. And that's exactly what happened in this story. God wanted to come close and he was right there. But even though he was right there, people started falling away. And as they drifted, the relationship began to go like this. And eventually God said, you don't need me anymore. And I think he felt wounded by the fact that he was really sort of put aside except for those special religious things gatherings, the rituals, the Christmas service and the Easter service, so to speak. And he just felt like this isn't a relationship. Relationships are about things that happen every day. And they said, we got you, God. We got you where we want you. And that's where we're going to keep you. God said, you know what? If you don't want me, I'll leave. And he did. And sure enough, very quickly, other people started taking an interest in this community and what they had to offer, especially in the form of resources and slaves and wealth in the temple. And a king from Babylon named Nebuchadnezzar came and just ransacked the whole thing, hauled these people off, and they didn't even know what hit them. As it's described in hindsight, and they're thinking... You never know what you got until it's gone. And the scripture describes them alongside the river, just weeping about the glory days when God was in our midst and we worshiped him and we were all in a good relationship. And why did we ever let the relationship 
go. And in that pain, they realize something that I think a lot of us don't realize. And that is when you have a good thing going, you don't really see the significance of it until it ends. And then you're like, well, I wish I could have just absorbed the magnitude of that. Kind of a funny story. We were, uh, the reason why that phrase rings so true to me is because the first time that I heard it, it was on a song that I think DC Talk or, or um, uh, uh, one of the, one of the uh, offshoots of that uh, was it Toby Mac. Thanks, honey. And one of the songs was, you never know what you got till it's gone. And my kids like to hear it. And we'd sing it in the car and stuff. And we went to TGI Fridays and had steaks one night. And this was a big steak. And I couldn't eat it all. But it was delicious. And I'm like, man, I'm going to save this for tomorrow. I'm, I'm just almost, even though I'm stuffed, I'm looking forward to that moment. So we chatted for a while. Waitress came, got our check, paid our check got her jackets, got up and walked out and drove way down the road. I'm like, Any, who, who got my steak? They're like, it's your steak. You should have got it yourself. <laughs> so a moment of panic just came over me. I immediately hit the brakes, went back to TGI Fridays. They're like, if you want it, it's out in the dumpster. Go get it. I'm like, I didn't want it that bad. And then to put insult to injury to a person, they all chimed in all at once. You never know what you got till it's gone. I have PTSD over that. I'm just going to leave it at that. But it helped me to appreciate the things that I do have. And so there's the outcome right there, if anything. And yet as the story unfolds, here's where it goes. God says, I wanted to come close. We, we had something going. Then it got too familiar, too comfortable, too cozy, really just too lackadaisical. And they just said, this relationship isn't even interesting anymore until they realized just how much it was. And you know, God, he could have said, I'm done with you. I'm just going to turn the gas on and the fires, and I'm just going to let loose. But here's what God said. No, I'm going to come even closer. And then one day in Bethlehem, little podunk town, six miles away from Jerusalem, God says, I'm showing up in a way that would just blow their minds. And he tells Mary, you're going to be overcome by my spirit. You're going to have a child through that Union, and he instructed Joseph, name him Jesus because he's going to be the Savior. And the prophet Isaiah was quoted in that moment saying his name is Emmanuel, God with us. And when God becomes one of us, it is the most intimate way that God could ever engage with our creaturely existence. And it wasn't just, I'm going to become one of us and I'm going to be preeminent and everybody's going to know I'm the golden child. But rather, no, my mom is going to be looked down upon by the people within her community because she conceived of a child out of wedlock. Scandalous. And they're not going to be so wealthy. And on and on it goes into the depths of everything that is really, in our mind, second rate messy, perhaps less than desirable, God said, that's where I want to show up. And I'm going to start by announcing that I'm coming to none other than these shepherds who smell like dung and probably a little bit of alcohol on their breath as well, because it's not exciting work. And I'm going to let them know, <laughs> I'm back. And I'm here for you. And at first they were afraid, the scripture says. And that fear turned into joy. Such unspeakable joy. They were so overwhelmed by God in every way 
And what this meant, because they knew what was going on in the backstory, that they realized this was an epic moment in place and time. And that, of course, is just rippling out through space and time into your world and into mine, into a place where if we don't understand the backstory, we won't appreciate what we have till it's gone. Lindsay's not going to appreciate me after I'm gone destroying her set. But God's looking at each of us and he's saying, what's keeping me away from you? Can't you see how much I really want to be a part of your world? And his son really has made all of that possible for us. If you think God's far away, think again. When you consider everything that God's done to show how awesome he is, and yet how compassionate he is, as his life just unfolded purposefully here on earth in a way that took people that we would call sinners and not really label them that way, but say, I just want you to know my healing, my love, my compassion. And took people that we would call righteous and saying, I want you to know that you're putting roadblocks between myself and the people that I love. And he called them out on it. And maybe Jesus is looking at your life in your pain, in your moment. And he's saying, can I come in? He may be doing a lot behind the scenes in your life right now in order to set up this moment so that when he asks, you're ready to respond. And my job is to just see if that moment is happening here today so that I can help you as you open the door to understand what you're opening yourself up to with a new life in him.